Hey everyone, this is Baphometrics, and today I'm going to be showing you how to make 128s in Bitwig. And as with all of my videos in this series, I'm coming at this specifically from the angle of Bitwig versus Ableton. So I have other videos in this series that you can find on my YouTube channel. You can find them all in this playlist that's called Producer Tutorials by Baphometrics. And this video is going to be number eight in the uh, series. So go back and check these out if you haven't seen them already. I think you'll find all of them useful. Um, as I'm walking through this today, I'm also going to be referring to my Bitwig handbook. And this is an online Google Doc. It's evergreen. I constantly update it. Uh, you'll find a link to this in the comments for the video. And specifically, I'm going to be talking today about this section here called Making 128s, and I'm also going to be talking about this section in the drum rack stuff about how to create something I call a drum pad 97. So you can come back here and, you know, if you want to remember how I did these things later, you can just follow the procedures in these sections. Um, so without further ado, the easiest way to explain a 128 is to just show you Show me using them. Uh, if you're not familiar with the concept, this should excite you, perhaps. Okay, so that's enough noise. These were just quick and dirty, uh, crappy things I, I built up real quick just to show you the, the possibilities. Now, let's go back and talk about what each one of these is actually doing. Uh, the basic two types of 128s are demonstrated in these two tracks right here. And uh, let's talk about a rhythmic 128 first. So you can see I've just got random MIDI notes going on here and uh, zoom this out again so we can see the whole clip. And these MIDI notes are being fed into a sampler. This is Bitwig sampler. I'm showing you the sampler from version 2.4, which isn't out yet. Bitwig is currently in version 2.3.5. I'm working with a beta of the brand new redesigned sampler. Uh, so in a few more weeks, or hopefully when 2.4 drops, you'll be able to apply all the stuff I'm showing you today. Um, but basically, this is a sampler that's loaded with a multi-sample. And you can tell that at a glance by seeing all these different slices here. If we blow this up to look at it more closely, we can see that we have all these different um, specific percussion one-shot files. And we can see that across the, the entire keyboard range from C negative two, through about midway through C8, um, well, Octave 8, I should say, <laughs> um, 
we have each of these one-shot samples assigned to one specific MIDI note, right? So they're very slender like this, and they, they cover every MIDI note. I can go to a different view of this, which kind of shows it in a different way, and you can see that each sample is assigned to a specific MIDI note, and that's it. So this is a, a rhythmic 128, and what we mean by rhythmic is as you play a MIDI clip, and let's make sure, uh, let's make sure I'm looking at the right MIDI clip. Just go close you again. Sorry about that. We'll just solo this clip for now. As I play this clip, you can see that the different samples are being triggered by the corresponding MIDI notes. Okay, so that's a rhythmic 128 in its purest sense. And the advantage of a rhythmic 128 is that it allows us to, you know, in this case, it's percussion being added to a drum groove. Okay, and you can experiment with different sounds uh, different patterns, different rhythms to, to find a percussion loop you like, for example, just by grabbing specific MIDI notes and moving them up and down. Like if I didn't like this very first note in the clip, this F5, right? I can pick a different note. Let's try a doinky glass note like that. See, I can't even hear it over that snare. Or I could move it a little bit. Okay, that sounds terrible, but you get the idea. You can just sit here and fine tune and tweak your MIDI uh, to just come up with a new um, sample. You could even run, I don't know, note randomizers into uh, this sampler and just see what the note randomizer comes up with. Or you could run an arpeggiator into the sampler and see what that comes up with. And it just gives you a way to experiment from a single palette of percussion sounds. So you could think of this entire multi-sample as a palette. Uh, and just like painters use palettes of different colors to work on their, their paintings, you can have a sonic palette of specific types of notes. Like I could come over here to my multi-sample collection and let's clear out the thing here. Let's say I didn't want to use percussion notes. Let's say I wanted to use uh, some sort of Foley gunshot effects. Well, I could just drag this gunshot multi-sample in here. And now these have all been completely replaced and the track now sounds like this. Okay. Hopefully this is already making you a little excited if you've never encountered 128s before. They're very versatile. So I have one clip. I can try out all kinds of different multi-samples of percussive sounds, like I could drag in a shaker's multi-sample here. Let's see what that sounds like instead. Okay. Drop this down. Let's hear it against the drum track. Okay, so that's a rhythmic 128. All kinds of one-shot sounds in a multi-sample. Each specific sample is assigned to one specific note, and then you can manipulate it with your um, uh, MIDI clip directly and just come up with all kinds of patterns and rhythms to use. Uh, okay, the next type of multi-sample is a variation of this rhythmic multi-sample. It's basically a rhythmic multi-sample, but adapted for use in a drum kit. So here I have a, a very typical drum pattern that's just a snare and a kick. Uh, this is a D and B type pattern. I'm running it a little slower than usual at 140 BPM, but you get the idea. So what this looks like is this is Bitwig's version of drum machine or a drum rack from Ableton. Looks almost exactly the same, works almost exactly the same, and I have a, a kick pad and a snare pad. Now on each of these pads, I've dragged a rack, a pre-built kind of rack I made that I call a drum pad 97. And again, 
when you're trying to recreate this for yourself, by looking at the guide, you want to come down here to the drum rack stuff and go to this section called How to Create a Drum Pad 97. And I'll show you these steps in detail later, but this is how you build one of these things. Um, the basic idea here, though, is that it's still at, it, at its heart. This kick pad is running a rhythmic, uh, a rhythmic 128 that uh, is kick drums, so it's full of kick drums. But there's a few more things tacked onto it to make it work inside of a drum kit. And the main thing being tacked onto it is inside of the sampler. Uh, let, me, let me close these down to make it a little simpler to understand at first. Uh, inside the sampler, there are two containers by default. And one of the container chains is sort of in front of the sampler. Even though it's here, these take effect before a MIDI note comes into the sampler. So this is where you put all of your note manipulation devices and, and modulators and whatever. So what I'm doing with these two things right here is manipulating the incoming MIDI notes and changing them to a different specific MIDI note. And I'll explain why later. But the point is I'm doing some manipulation of the incoming MIDI notes. Basically, this is the high level, this kick is always going to trigger a C1 MIDI note. And what I'm doing is I'm taking that C1 and making sure that uh, it can be manipulated to play any of these possible notes from C0 all the way through C8, right? And I can do that by just taking this one knob hiding right here and moving it around. By, by moving the selector knob, I'm taking that incoming C1 MIDI note and just transposing it to a different MIDI note so that it'll play the different samples all throughout this range of C0 through C8. So these two devices, these two note pitch shifter devices, are just playing with the MIDI notes to make that happen. Uh, the other thing that's going on in this particular rack, of course, is I have this macro knob or shortcut knob mapped to you know these two devices in a certain way that accomplishes that transposition so that a C1 incoming note is always transposed to one specific note in this multi-sample range. And then the other thing I have going on is just a, an added thing I do for a lot of my drum sounds, which is I have a modulator called random uh, that is creating a shape a random kind of shape that is a, a mapped to the start position of a sample. So just real briefly, let me show you what that looks like. We're going to go into the sample view. We're going to figure out which sample I'm actually playing. Let's go back to this view for a second. Uh, and let's just solo the drum track. So that's the only thing playing. OK, uh, so let's play this. So here's my sample right here that's being played, the kick sample. So if I click, if I click this kick sample that was being played, I can now see the waveform. Now I want you to look at the left side of the sample. This is where the transient of the kick is occurring, right? And what this randomizer is going to do is it's assigned to the play start, the play offset of the sample. And as I turn this knob up, you're going to see the randomized value getting stronger and stronger. Like as I pull this down, there is no change to the value, but as I start pushing this up, it starts randomizing a tiny bit by these tiny little up and down movements of the line. As I keep increasing the range of it, the randomization jumps get bigger. And as I go all the way to the end of my range, the randomization jumps are really big. And you can see over here that this little yellow play start position, this, this start position for the playhead on the sample is jumping all around at the same rate as the randomization. And it's jumping a lot when I have this knob fully uh, cranked open, or it's only jumping around a tiny bit near the very beginning. You can see a little bit of wiggle movement right here. So all this is doing is it's just, it's giving the drums a more humanized feel, the kick drum a more humanized feel. When a human drummer plays a kick, they don't hit it the same way every single time. 
So the transients can sound different uh, from note to note. And so this is just simulating that. It's just a little trick I do in, in uh, most of my drum samples to make them sound a little more realistic and a little less mechanical and robotic. So this is what it sounds like. Let's uh, solo this one specific drum pad. We're just gonna solo the kicks. And I do that by clicking this button here. Let's pick a different sample. <laughs> There, that's a good sample. So let's find that one so you can see it happening on the actual, where are you? There you are. Okay, not too much of a transient, but as I start cranking this up, see how sometimes the kick is sharper and other times it's a little more muffled sounding? So this is a great trick and uh, I teach you how to do this in this procedure about how to create a drum pad 97. So the main point here is that um, you could just go to any drum pad, like let's say I want to put a open hi-hat or, or yeah, let's put an open hi-hat on this F1 pad. So the way I would do that is I'm in my drum rack. Uh, let's go ahead and close this down because we don't need it anymore. Um, I'm going to come over here to my presets. I've pre-built this rack called Drum Pad 97. Drag it onto my F1. Click this to make sure I'm looking at that particular chain and this particular device that I just dragged on. Now by default, it's just got some random kicks in it that I used when I built this rack. But now I'm going to go over to my multi-sample tab and I'm going to go find my open hats, which are where? Here we go, hat open and I'll just drag this multi-sample into the sampler. And now uh, I have a set of open hi-hats on this pad. And if I were to incorporate these into the drum pattern, uh, now I would have open hi-hats and then I could select which exact hi-hat sound I wanted. I could decide how much I want the transient of that hi-hat to be randomly shifted around each time a new note hits it and so on. So very, very useful, very powerful. And again, the concept here, and this isn't my concept. This is a concept that uh, uh, Il Gates taught me. Uh, Il Gates is one of my mentors. I love him. He's brilliant. Um, class of 808 forever. But um, this is basically a concept of his that you, you can produce faster if during your sound design sessions you create palettes of associated sounds, like I have palettes of gunshot sounds, crashes, claps, 808s, kicks, shakers, snares, and so on. And this is just one type of palette for rhythmic sounds. And I can either use them in a drum kit like this, or as I showed you with this rhythmic 128 sample, I could use them by themselves and instead manipulate them with a, a, a MIDI clip. And these are palettes of sounds. If I don't like this palette, as you saw me do, I dragged in gunshots and tried them as a kind of spice to the drum kit. I tried shakers. I tried more common vanilla percussion sounds. And they're all different palettes that you just drag in as you're composing to quickly find like, okay, I think I want shakers here. Let me drag in my shaker palette and see what I can come up with. And it just saves you so much time compared to manually scrolling around inside of your sample library and finding one shaker at a time and trying it in a MIDI pattern and going, gosh, I don't like that. And then digging around and, and, and previewing and auditioning all sorts of different percussion sounds or shakers. And it's just slow, slow, slow to do it the traditional way. It's much faster to pre-create common palettes for sounds you use all the time and just at least in the early stages of production like I don't have to think too much about the drum sounds themselves if I want to make a D and B tune I could just drag in my kick and snare palette I could crank the tempo up to like 174 176 whatever I could crank out a quick beat that would work in a, a D and B sense or a neuro sense and then 
I don't care what the actual kick and snare sounds are yet. I'm just trying to get a beat going so I can start writing a song. I can start super looping and arranging and coming up with ideas. And as I go along and as the song builds up and the mix becomes more cluttered and full, and I find that a particular kick sound that I've been using isn't really cutting through the mix very well, well, I still don't have to do anything drastic. I can just come to my drum machine track and I can come over here to the kick pad and I can just twiddle the selector until I find a kick that sounds a little bit better in the mix at that point. And it's only much later in the process when I'm when I'm starting to detail and finalize the song that then I'll get really specific about my kick. And I'll get specific about the processing on that kick. And I'll start, you know, really making sure it's compressed right and that it sounds good, the transients are good on it, it's cutting through the mix the way I want, so on and so forth. So palettes save you time. And 128s are a core type of palette. Okay, so I've been talking about rhythmic 128s, but let's also review the other type of 128, which is a melodic 128. Now, the difference between a melodic 128 and a rhythmic 128 is that you notice this grid looks a little different by default in the sampler. Here's a rhythmic 128. Slices assigned to each specific MIDI note. A melodic 128 has the bars going horizontally, which if we blow it up and take a close look at it, uh, if this were the grid view, it doesn't look that exciting. It just looks like all of my sp different samples span the entire length of the keyboard from C negative two to whatever the hell this one is up here, <laughs> right? Um, so what's happening here is we need to flip into the slightly different view of the sampler where we start showing the spread of the key zone range versus the uh, velocity range here in this side. This is the velocity range from 0 to 127 or 1 to 127, whatever velocity numbers are. And then when I click the star, this is showing me something called the selector range from 1 to 127. And so you can see that every one of these samples spans the entire keyboard, all the MIDI notes, but there's a thing that says only play this sample or only play this sample. And the thing that decides which one of these samples to play is determined by this index number of this, what they call the selector. And that's built into the sampler is this knob right here called select. You won't see visual feedback if I'm not running any MIDI, but if I run the MIDI for this, Let's uh, collapse this for a second, make sure this particular thing is soloed. Let's come back to the sampler and blow it up again. So now as I move this knob around, you're gonna see it pick different samples to play. And it's doing that based on, you know, what is the value of this knob? What does that translate to in this total range from 0 to 127? And so which one of the selectors is it landing on and therefore which sample is it playing? So watch that for a second. Okay, you get the idea. So briefly, let's flip over to Ableton and let's look at how this kind of relates to the way Ableton sampler looks. By the way, pardon the noise in the background. I work in a noisy room. Uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, so as we come to Ableton and we look at a typical rhythmic sample, um, this is Ableton sampler. You can see the full uh, you can see the individual sample, or you can see the full uh, zone of samples. So Ableton has their three zones represented by these three buttons here when you expand the zone window. So there's the key zone, right? And you can see that since this is a rhythmic sample, it's assigning one key per sample. And again, that's exactly like this side of Bitwig. Let's go back to a rhythmic 128. So 
this, this grid-like zone here, or if I'm in this view, just this whole side with the keyboard, represents the um, key zone, the same thing as the key zone in Ableton. Now, Ableton also has a velocity zone, and in, in a rhythmic 128, all of the notes are going to uh, respond to the full velocity range from 1 to 127. And that corresponds in Bitwig to when you're in this particular view right here with this button plus this little symbol, which means velocity. So when you've got these two things clicked, this represents the velocity zone right here. And you can always tell that by looking at the symbol in the grid here as well. And then finally in Ableton, uh, they have their version of a selector zone, which is this cell button. And there's this little blue thing that you can move across the top and you could map to a macro key, right? I could map it to a macro key if I wanted to. And what that's doing is this value right here is the index of the selector zone. So when it's all the way cranked over here, that means it's index zero, index number zero. This would be index number eight. This would be 9, 10, 12, 16, and so on, all the way up to 127. And that's exactly what you see here in Bitwig when you have this two-part thing selected and you click the star. The star is Bitwig's selector zone. So again, we're currently looking at a rhythmic 128, so neither the velocity zone nor the selector zone are used. Instead, what differentiates all the samples is the specific key, the specific MIDI note number that comes into the sampler. But in a rhythmic, I'm sorry, a melodic 128, the difference is now that every sample spans the entire key range, so you can play each sample melodically. That's why we call it a melodic 128. It'll respond to different notes and shift the sample accordingly to different pitches. And then over here on the right-hand side, you can see that the velocity is, every, every sample can respond to the full velocity range, but there's a specific index number that decides which of these samples to play. So it's, it's exactly the same as Ableton, just looks different, and you set it up and configure it a little bit differently. So uh, I'm not going to bother going through how you create 128s in Ableton. There are tons of other videos out there about this. Uh, Ill Gates was the first person to sort of popularize the technique. I don't know if he actually created the technique, but he was certainly the one that popularized it way before anyone else. And then over time, other other people have picked it up. And so you you can find tutorials by other people about it, but just search, search on YouTube and you will find plenty of tutorials about how to make 128s in Ableton. So I'm not going to go over that. I'm going to talk about how to do it in Bitwig. Um, so we're going to start a little bit from scratch and uh, go back and talk about traditional multi-samples. I'm going to go to this track here and we'll just um, play it like a MIDI keyboard. Now you'll notice this, this grid looks a little different now than anything I've showed you so far. If we blow it up and I start playing some MIDI notes, like I'll play an F2 or 3. Oh, an F1. So I'm playing an F1. Here's an F2. Here's an F3. And you can see as I play each octave of F note, it's picking a different sample in this grid. And what you're looking at here is telling you that each sample, like, let's go back to the um, F1. If I hold, if I click this sample, we can see if we kind of roll our eyes down here that it's covering the lines start at F1 and they end at E1. So the keys F, F1, F sharp one, and E1 will play this specific sample. And this little uh, key tracking symbol here is making it change pitch across a three semitone range. So here's F, F sharp, and E. 
all play in that same sample. And in a traditional multi-sample, the idea is you'll take the original instrument and you will sample it a bunch of different times at different uh, notes, different octaves, and also different velocities. Like a guitar string sounds very different if you pluck it hard with a, with a plectrum versus if you pluck it and palm mute it at the same time or if you pluck the string with your finger, all of those different, or if you pluck it softly or pluck it, twang it really hard, the timbre of that string is gonna change depending on the velocity or, or way that you pluck it. And so a lot of traditional multi-samples will play one sample at a high velocity, a slightly different sample at a lower velocity, and you know they may have several velocity ranges. This is the lowest velocity range here because it starts at one and goes up to 127 on the right hand side here. Um, and then you know they say we can only stretch this sample so far before the key tracking kind of pitch shift for each note starts sounding unnatural. So we're gonna sample a very narrow range of like one root note. So again, if I click this sample and we can see that the actual root of that particular sample, and that's also indicated by this tiny little triangle right here. See how it's sitting in the middle of the range between these two lines? That means that the, the, the note they actually sampled was F1. And they decided that for this particular instrument, they could, they could let it automatically shift down one semitone on either side before it started sounding unnatural, okay? So this is what a typical multi-sample looks like, and this is the typical use for multi-samples. Um, but a 128, especially a melodic 128, is a different kind of multi-sample. Not every type of sound is good for a melodic 128. Like, I couldn't I couldn't just grab a bunch of random guitar string samples all set to note F, or let's say F3, and drop them into a 128 and expect them to sound good when I played F2 or F1. Or even C1 might start sounding weird, right? So because you're stretching it too far from its original root note for the sample. So most of the time, Melodic 128s are most useful for sounds like bass tops. Like it can be really useful to make a layer of a melodic 128 full of very different bass top sounds, which is essentially what's in this melodic 128. These are kind of bass top sounds, but they're also a little rhythmically different, some of them. But you would typically like put this in a, a an instrument layer or yeah, you put them in an instrument layer or an FX layer with um, some sort of sub sampler, a sampler full of sub bass sounds. And then you would have this nice fat kind of mid bass sound to use in the middle of your drops. And you could be coming up with a simple melodic pattern like you have here to vary that mid bass sound. And you know, later on in, in mixing, you can decide how much of that sub to roll off with a high pass filter. But the point is, you typically use melodic 128s to create uh, bass type sounds. Uh, something that's fuzzy and wide and fills out the frequency spectrum and doesn't sound too bad if you stray from the original sampled note, which in this case, let's see, do I still have it? Yeah, all of these bass samples I dragged in here were all done at F, and I'm thinking probably F2 because these were meant to be bass tops. So these are either F2 or F3, and they're all F, so they all sound roughly the same when I bring them in and play F. And I could go up or down a little bit in, in note pitch, like here I'm playing C3 to D3, and that sounded okay. I could also um, have shifted these up to F3. Show me the money. Uh, F3, right? And they, of course, would have sounded really good here because F is probably, it's either F3 or F2 is where the root of each sample is. So with a um, certain kinds of sounds, you can get away with using them as melodic 128s, but a melodic 128 isn't useful for every type of sound. 
Typically, this comes into play when you're building really interesting, heavy basses for bass music uh, and to use in your drops and so on. Okay, rhythmic 128s are by far the more common type of 128. Uh, so I'm going to show you how to build both of them. Oh, and what else can I show you? I made this for some reason. Oh, yeah, for example, this is my bass. Um, this is a sub bass that I, I commonly use. And this is a traditional multi-sample, but it's a very simple one. So if we look carefully at this, this was done um, by sampling one note at a time in the range of C1 through C2, or rather, yeah, B2, just a two octave range where the sub usually lives, right? And uh, it was one note at a time sampled and then brought in here as a multi-sample. One velocity all the way through. It's not velocity sensitive at all. It's just going to play that sample hard, <laughs> right? And that's what you want in a sub bass. And so, for example, I could, uh, to just sort of demonstrate what I talked about a moment ago, I could take this same MIDI clip and let's duplicate it down to that sample. And we'll play them both together. And let's see, I probably have to shift these down to F1. So let's grab all these and go down two octaves. One, two. Okay, so now these are in the range F1 and G1 are the two notes it's going to play. And I'll have to balance it out a little bit. Let's take that volume down. Let's see what it sounds like. Oops, not you. Okay, you get the idea. It's just random noise. I wouldn't actually build a bass that sounded like this, but that's the basic idea. And you could put these in the same track together on an instrument selector chain. Look at my previous videos to learn about stuff like that, or an instrument layer chain, I should say. Um, so let's talk about how to build these from scratch so you understand the process. We'll start with a brand new MIDI track down here. And uh, let's get rid of some noise so we can focus on this one. So first we'll start with a rhythmic 128. And you create that by bringing in Bitwig Sampler. And you know, by default, the way the sampler works is if you drag some sort of... Oh. Fuck's sake. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> I am so sorry about that. I meant to have that off before starting this. And also, this is how you control the volume of your previews. Okay, so anyway, um, if you take a specific sample and drag it in, you know, it just looks like one sample, and you can do all the usual sampler stuff with this. Uh, but to create a multi-sample, I'm going to clear this out by right-clicking and choosing Clear. And either in the small window here or in the larger window, you click the Create New Multi-Sample button, and now you have an empty multi-sample editor. Um, for Rhythmic 128s, I prefer to use this view, not this view. Both of them will work, but I find this one a little simpler to work with. So let's go find some samples that are drum oriented. Let's see, let's get rid of you. I think I pre-opened one with a bunch of samples in it. Yeah. Where are my drum loops? There we go. So, this is not what I was expecting to see. What am I missing? Uh, 
Oh, that's a USB, of course. There we go. So I have some drum one shots in this library. And here's a bunch of snares. And there's more than 100 of them, which I can tell by this 99 symbol here. I'm not sure exactly how many are here, but we're going to figure that out. It looks like from the numbers alone, we get up to 129, 130. It's about 135 total, which is perfect because I want to show you, you know, how to grab like 128 at a time, how to tell when you have too many or not enough. And the basic idea is if I wanted to fill this thing completely out with 128 different snares like I would in Ableton, I can do that. Or these could be percussions or any kind of sample I want. So you basically just grab a whole bunch and we'll grab down to about here. And we'll start clicking and dragging. And now you see how it turned into this little square symbol that indicates I can drop this somewhere. And after I wait a few moments, it sort of processes all those samples in memory. And I can eyeball how many I have. And I can choose where to, where to drop the range, like where that range should start. Okay. And I can tell I don't have quite 128 samples yet. I still could probably grab about seven more. Okay, so I'm not going to drop them. I'm just going to come back here and let go. I'm going to add a few more samples to the, to the pile here. I'm just going to grab all the way down to here. And now I'm going to click and drag again. And now th this time, you notice it stays this no symbol, this bar circle symbol. That means you have too many samples. There's more than 128. I'm not going to let you drop them into the sampler. I kind of wish Ableton would do this, but it doesn't. It's kind of hard to count up the right number of samples in Ableton. Uh, but in Bitwig, it lets you know, nope, got too many samples. So I come back here and let go of my mouse. And I'm just going to use my shift key to keep, you know, deselecting a few samples at a time until I finally have a full 128 samples and it'll take them. I still have too many samples. I'm going to let go here. Knock it down, knock the selection down one more time to here. Drag it in again. I still have too many samples. Knock the selection down by holding my shift key. Drag it in again and ah, suddenly it changes to that and it lets me pull them all in. And you can see I have exactly 128 samples. And each one of them, if I were to let go of my key right here, it would assign each one of these samples to one key across the full keyboard range. But I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do that because in Bitwig, it's typically better to make what I call a 97 and not a 128. There's a reason for that magic number 97 that I'll get into in a minute. But the main idea here is that I'm going to now select a much smaller amount of samples and drag it over again. In Bitwig, the whole trick is to create your samples starting at C0, right where I'm dropping it. And you want it to stop at C8. So I still have too many samples for a 97. I've got more than 97 here because C0 through C8 is exactly 97 samples. So we're going to go back. I'm going to pick my range again. Shift, click. Drag it in one more time, start here at C0. I still have too many, but I'm getting closer. Come back here and let go. Maybe I'll try from here, drag this over, drop it on C0. It's still one, two, I've got two samples too many. So I'm gonna come back here and do this. And now I should have exactly the right amount of samples to make a 97. There we go. So I come over here to C0, this is the magic starting point, and I let go, and it drops those samples in here, and they, there's exactly 97 of them, and they span from C0 to C8. Okay, so at this point, you could use this button right up here to save this multi-sample to your user library, or I could use this button right here on the sampler to do the same thing. Uh, but if I do either button, it basically says, okay, what name do you want to give the multi-sample? What category do you want to assign it to? Like, you know, is it drums? Is it percussion? Is it snare? Other things. They have these sort of canned categories that unfortunately you can't change for yourself. You just have to pick from one of them. I often just leave this blank. I might type in a keyword like, you know, snares. 
uh, here just to have a tag to search for. Um, I usually don't use these predefined tags, but you're welcome to. And then I might put in a description of what this is. You can put, type really long descriptions like I talked about in an earlier video. Um, but at any rate, I'm not going to save this because this is a beta version and I don't want to mess up my user library with things I can't use in my production version, but you get the ideas. All you, all you do is click either this button or this button or even, no, you can't right click and do save as. So it's either this one or this one and save the sample. Uh, maybe I can do save from here. Yeah. If I right click in the, the title bar of the device, I can also choose preset, save preset to library, and that's the same as clicking this button. So if I were to save this multi-sample, it would end up here in my multi-sample tab as, you know, under my creator name, uh, and I have an auto collection that automatically pulls together every multi-sample that's been created by Baphometrics. So here they all are right here. And this is how you make the multi-samples. And I always like to name them with the word 97 in front of them, in case somewhere down the road I have lots of other types of multi-samples. This would keep them all grouped together uh, when I'm browsing up and down through my multi-samples. So anyway, that's the basic process for creating a one-shot multi-sample or a rhythmic multi-sample. Now, just briefly, let's see what it looks like this way. In this view, you can still see that for each sample, it's assigned to one key of the keyboard all the way through this range from C0 to C8. And you can see that velocity-wise, each sample will respond to the any velocity. And the index selector is just like superfluous for this type of 128. Now, another thing you might be asking yourself is, yeah, well, what about key tracking? Should those samples have key tracking on or off? And in a rhythmic multi-sample, in a, in a 97 or a 128, however you want to call it, uh, it doesn't matter whether key tracking is on or off because it's only ever going to play one specific note for that sample. And uh, it's going to depend, well, it's only ever going to play one note. Uh, and the key tracking is kind of superfluous. So if you want, if, if for some reason you decide you want to turn off key tracking for all of these samples, uh, you could. And you would do that by selecting the first one and doing, I see, can I do control A? Yeah, I can use control A to select all of them. And you'll notice that, hey, wait a minute, where'd my key tracking button go? <laughs> right, that's a little bit of a problem, isn't it? Um, you, would, you would instead do it not through this key tracking button, but if you look over here in the inspector, uh, you'll see that there's a key track field right here. And if it's 100%, that means it's key tracking 100% of the range. If I select multiple samples, you can see that this still occurs, but now it's telling me you're looking at the, the details for a zone that has four items in it. That's what this four means. So if I were to take this key track slider right here and drag it down to zero, and then we look at each of these four individual samples, we'll see that key tracking is now off for these four samples. Okay, so if for some reason you make a rhythmic 128 and you think that key tracking is somehow messing you up, you can turn it off this way. You just click the first sample, do control A, come over here to the inspector, find the key track thing and just drag it down to zero. And now suddenly all of these samples have the key tracking turned off. Okay, so remember that, that's a tricky one. That may throw you off at some point, but that's how you, turn off key tracking on mass for all samples. And you could turn it on for all of them the same way, like control A, come over here to key track, wang it up to 100% again. And then as you come back and look at each sample, you'll see that this key track button is activated and it will act uh, in a 100% kind of normal fashion and, and respond to all your MIDI notes appropriately. Okay, so that's rhythmic 128s. Now let's talk about how to build a melodic 128. And this one's a little trickier. Wait, 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 wait. Before I show you that, I also want to show you how you can build up a rhythmic 128 
in little chunks at a time because it's not always convenient to go into your sample library and grab, you know, 197 or 128 samples in a row from some folder in your sample library and trust that they're all good. A lot of times, some of your samples are kind of crappy and you wouldn't necessarily want to save them in a, in a palette in your user library. So how could you do this one sample at a time, really understanding everything you're putting in the sampler? Let's clear this out. We're gonna start over from scratch and create a new multi-sample. And this time I'm gonna audition these one at a time. Now I'm gonna make sure the volume's low and I'm gonna turn on the, um, uh, what does this do again? Preview new selections, and this is whether it's synchronized to the transport. I'm going to turn off synchronized to transport so it just plays each sample individually. And so we'll listen to these one at a time. So let's say I like this one. I drag it in, I set it on C0, and I move on, find another one. Okay, I like that one. Let me drag that one in and put it on the next, you know, slot right next to C0. And you could build it up one sample at a time like this. You could be scrolling all through your sample library, picking the best snares for a particular genre. Like let's say you wanted a palette of 97 of your best dubstep snares. And then you wanted to create a different palette of your 97 best uh, D&B snares. And then you wanted to build another palette of your 97 best trap snares and so on. This is how you could do it one by one if you wanted to. Or you could grab a few snares. Let's say we liked all three of these. And you can drag them in. And now here's one little gotcha. Watch what happens as I move my mouse upward towards the top, away from the keyboard. Do you see how these start spreading out? This is the default behavior for creating a traditional multi-sample. And what's happening here is depending on how far you move your mouse away from your keyboard, each sample will spread out to cover a one octave range. So I'm gonna keep moving up, find that spot where there. If you look at the bottom of these three rows, you'll see that the sample I'm holding on to spans from C2 to B2. The next sample spans from C3 to B3 and the third sample spans from C4 to B4. And then if I start pushing my mouse any further up, it's gonna say, screw it. I'm gonna make all three of these samples span the entire keyboard range. And you might wanna do that because in another step, you would go over and start adjusting the velocity range for each of those samples or the selector range for each of those samples. So the main thing to remember here is when you're building 128s and you're dragging in a small group of samples, just make sure you pull your keyboard downward closer towards the keyboard at the bottom until you're certain that each one of these samples is only spanning one key each, one note each, and just drop it in right next to the other one. Uh, you could also do things like say, you know what, for whatever reason, I don't want that sample in that position. I'd rather have it here and you can move it that way. Um, or let's say I built an early set of my best 97 dubstep snares and I've, you know, I've grabbed, grabbed whole groups and I've, I've built up a 97 carefully group by group and make sure I don't have an overlap there. And then, you know, it's a year down the road and I finally decide, you know what, I really hate that snare. <laughs> I don't want that snare anymore. Well, you can select it and delete it and go find a diff different snare. What would be a dub snippy snare? Okay, that could be possibly a dubstep snare. So you can drag that one in place of the other one and let go. And then just save again and save it over the exact same name as before. And you basically have just overwritten your older 97 multi-sample. Okay, you've got a, you've updated your palette. So it's real easy to work with uh, Bitwig in this way. It's, you can't really work the same way in Ableton. Ableton's kind of all or nothing. You have to drag in 128 samples exactly. Well, let me show you. Ableton has this feature where if I've dragged in 128 samples and you select all of them with Control A right here, and then you right click and you do distribute ranges equally. This is the only easy way in Ableton 
to make each note, each sample span only a single note is with this distribute ranges equally. So that's why I say it's all or nothing with Ableton. You can't drag in 10 samples at a time as easily. I mean, you kind of can, but then you have to keep, you know, selecting them all and doing distribute ranges equally. And it's kind of hard to count. There's no like number indicator here to tell you how many samples you have and whether you finally have 128 or not. So it's very hit or miss trial and error in Ableton to build a rhythmic 128. It's a little bit easier in Bitwig because you can visually see when you have the right number of samples. And as you're dragging them in, you're already setting them up to be exactly one note wide each. Okay, so that's everything about uh, Rhythmic 128s. Now let's clear this out and let's show you how to build a melodic 128. So we're going to create a new multi-sample again. And when you're working with melodic 128s, you don't want to work in this grid view, right? You always want to select this button here. And I prefer to grab this horizontal scroll bar and make this section of the window as wide as possible. So again, if this button is highlighted, this is showing me my velocity range, my velocity zone. I don't want velocity. I'm making a rhythm. I'm sorry, a melodic 128. So I want the sample selector. I want the select zone. So you want to make sure you're seeing this little star here. Now the trick is, uh, let's see, I should have, let's do some ARPs. So I've got like more than 100 ARP loops in this folder. And ARPs typically aren't a good thing to put in a 128, but we'll use it just for fun. Um, so if I grab, oh God. we'll turn that off. Um, if I grab um, a set of ARPs and click and drag and hold my mouse button down, I want to drop them somewhere in this window. And you'll see that it's automatically distributing the ranges as equally as possible as I drop them in. And if I let go, I now have each sample spanning the full keyboard range so it can be played melodically. And I also have um, a fairly wide set of index values in the selector knob to choose each sample. So. You know, there's about 20 samples here, so I might have to move the select knob, you know, that far to jump from the first sample to the second sample, and so on. Um, so the problem with Bitwig is if I go grab a different set of samples, scroll way up here, and let's say I want to get these samples into my 128 and I drag them here. You see how it redistributed the ranges again just for this new set of samples I dragged in? All right, that can be a little bit of a hassle. And unfortunately, there is no magic distribute ranges equally button. I have no way to say, take my total set of samples and just redistribute the range for selectors. Now it's possible, I'm, I'm showing you, I'm doing this video with a beta version of the sampler and I have put in two different feature requests during the beta testing period saying, Bitwig devs, you really need to add a distribute samples equally distribute ranges equally for the multi-samples. And again, I apologize for the sounds in the background. I work in a noisy room and there's stuff going on. Um, so it's possible by the time Bitwig 2.4 actually rolls out that they will have added that feature because they clearly have the code for it or it wouldn't be doing it the first time you drop something in. They just have to make a new menu option to effectively execute that same function. Um, and they've said that uh, they, they've told me that basically, yeah, we agree, but we're not sure we can get it in before the end of the, the beta. So this feature might come later, but regardless, there's a, an easy workaround to deal with this and to get everything laid out the way you want. So you have two choices. You can either make sure you're pulling in exactly the right number of samples the first time around. So if I clear this and I grab, you know, something like, this many samples and drag them. Oops, let's create a new multi-sample. Go here, go here, make this a little bigger. 
Okay, if I drag in this larger set of samples, you can, you can visually see that it's going to distribute the range fairly equally. And I can let go and double check and see how far it went. And I can say, well, I still have room for a lot more samples, right? And so you could just clear this out <laughs> and do it again, so on and so forth, uh, until you get the right amount of samples. But there's an easier way. And the way that I like to do it is I kind of eyeball this and I say, well, I got up to about 67 samples. So I want about another 60 more. And um, I'll just come in here and start grabbing some more samples and drag them in and let go and kind of eyeball them and count them up. And I'll get somewhere in the right ballpark. Okay. And then here's the trick. This is really cool. I've dragged a bunch of samples into my multi-sampler. They're in the project, but they haven't been um, collected and saved into the project yet. So I can go to the project manager window, which is this button right down here in the bottom uh, where I'm wiggling my mouse. And if I go and I say, show me all of my external samples, like I haven't collected these into the project yet, and you can see it, it separates the multi-samples I've already dragged in and used from regular samples. Multi-samples are grouped together because they're all, you know, this name. And so what I could do is just create a new, uh, I could duplicate this track, go to the second copy of the track, and in that sampler, clear the multi-sample editor, bring it up again, come over here, select the right range again, and then from my own project manager, I can grab all those samples, come all the way to the bottom. Okay, I see there's one multi-sample in the middle of it. I'm gonna, well, I don't want the, I don't want the base one shots too, so I'll stop at the ARPS. And now if I drag them from my file manager over here and let go, you can see that I've got more, like it went further this time. I'm up to about 80 something samples. And so when you're sound designing and trying to fill up a 128, if you really want a 128 with a whole bunch of samples in it, you could just keep doing this process of duplicate, come to the duplicated one, clear it out, set it up again for a new multi-sample, and um, set it up to receive velocity. And now I've got all these selected. I'm going to do shift. I'm going to grab some of the base one shots too, just to finish this out. Let's go down to here. And I'll deselect this one multi-sample by holding down control. Normally, you wouldn't be mixing multi-samples and other sample types. If you were in a sound design session and your, your goal was to build a new multi-sample of bass tops, you wouldn't have all these other stuff in here to worry about. You just keep dragging in new bass tops until you had enough, and you'd just be able to select any, any of these. So I'm going to drag these in and let go. And scroll down to the bottom and see I'm getting real close. I probably have about 100 multi-samples now. You know, if I kind of eyeball where this line is, there's about 100, 108. And so you can just keep going like this until you finally fill out the sampler to the full range you want. Okay, so that's the basic mechanics. And this is an easy way without too much extra hassle to, you know, build it up one set at a time until you have enough things that you like. Now... In a, in a melodic 128, you don't necessarily need a full 128 samples. Uh, it could be 20. Maybe you just have 20 really good dubstep bass tops that you use all the time in composing as like placeholder sounds. So you don't have to fill this up to a full 100 or so. And you'll just have to experiment with what you want to make. And, you know, if there's a hundred of them, then moving this knob a tiny bit will select each individual sample. But if there's only 20 of them, it's a little easier to work with this knob because you can move it a fairly large amount before it finally selects the next multi-sample in the 128, like if there's only 20 of them. So it really boils down to how you like to work with this knob, how much you want to move it, um, so on and so forth, how many different related sounds you want in the same palette, and so on. Now here's a trick. I'm going to show you a little trick. If you do cram this multi-sample full of 100 
and 28 different samples, and you find that this knob's really fidgety and it's skipping too many samples each time you drag it up and down, you know, of course you can hold down shift and drag this up and down to move it in a much more granular, smaller, incremental fashion. And that makes it easier to select each multi-sample as you're auditioning them while, while your clip is playing. But even that might still be too fidgety for you. So here's a simple trick to uh, make it easier to work with a big 128 pack with lots of samples. And we're going to do this by opening the uh, macro uh, modulator panel and we're going to add two macro knobs to this modulator. I'm going to click that button while I'm still here and grab it again. So I have two different macro knobs and I'm going to um, make sure the select button is all the way down at the bottom. I'm going to grab the first macro knob, click its arrow, and drag upwards on this until it's right at plus 50. Okay, so that's halfway through its travel, 50% of its travel from 0 to 100%. Then I'm going to click this to stop that assignment, and I'm going to move this knob up to exactly 50%. Here, I'll hold control and click on it to just enter 50%. Save myself a little time. So it's at exactly the 50% mark. And then I'm going to grab this little button and click it, this modulator assignment button. And now from the 50% mark, I'm going to drag it up another 50%, which will take me all the way to 100, 100%. And I stop here and I can double check the uh, total set of assignments over here by selecting the whole sampler. And these little blue arrows indicate my modulators that I've set up. And you can see this one here says 0 0.495. That means 49 and a half percent. So I didn't, even though I visually dragged it until it said 50, it wasn't exactly at 50. So I'm just going to double click this and make this 0.5. And this one's 0.5. So now here's what happens if I if I leave this down here by default and I were to save this uh, in my project or save it as a, a new preset or something. As I move this knob up, I can I can swing it through its full range and it's only going to drag up the real select knob by half. And then as I drag this one up, it goes the rest of the way to 100. Right. And so. I could stop here and just use these two knobs, or I could, you know, go a step further and maybe make a new custom uh, shortcut page and then close this. And then I could make the shortcut page, this knob here, react to this one, and I can make this one here react to this macro. And then, for example, I could now map another knob to my pitch in the sampler, and I could map another knob to, I don't know, the attack in the sampler. And so now I have this shortcut rack. I don't need to see those modulators anymore. And these two knobs will do the same thing. As I move this through its full range, it moves the real select knob only halfway through its travel. And then as I move this, it moves the rest of the way through its travel. So basically, this knob will select among the first 50 or 60 samples I have. And then if I leave it all the way full, this will keep going from 61 through 127. Okay, see how that works? If you experiment with it on your own, you'll get a feel for it. But if you need, if for some reason you feel like this knob is too fidgety for selecting your samples, like you can't move it carefully enough and slowly enough, this is the trick for making it easier to just, you know, select whatever you want. Just make sure this starts at zero and off you go. Okay, so that's a simple trick for dealing with uh, cleanly and surgically selecting exactly the sample you want while the multi-sample is playing. So the last thing I want to show you is we're going to go back to the Rhythmic 128, which is just, you know, meant to be, if, you, if I just drop this into a track by itself, it's meant to be triggered with a MIDI clip. That's how you would trigger all the different samples in it. But what if you want to put it in a drum rack? What if you want to create all of your, uh, what if you want to create a whole set of multi-samples that could be used either rhythmically or in a drum rack? Uh, and let me show you what I mean by that. Let's take, 
get rid of these tracks. And let's just put in a new track. Okay. So let's say I have this uh, percussion 97 and I drop it onto this track. When I just drop it on by itself, this is meant to be played with a MIDI clip like, you, like I showed you earlier, okay? Because the only thing that's going to trigger these different samples are specific MIDI notes. But what if you also want to be able to reuse this same percussion rack in a drum machine? Okay, so let's make a new MIDI track. Let's drop a drum machine into this track. Okay, so if I drag this percussion um, 97 onto like this pad and let go, it seems like it should be able to play normally, right? But watch what happens if I play this pad. First of all, I have the wrong thing selected. <laughs> Let's make sure I'm actually playing my drum track. Oh, for fuck's sake, what are you doing? Is that the actual percussion sound? Let's find out. Oh, that was the actual percussion sound. So the problem is, if I just drag this um, Rhythmic 128 into a drum rack pad, as it is, <laughs> I'm so sorry for the noise, um, and I play it, it's only going to play the one exact sample in this entire range that relates to uh, F1 right here. Okay, so that's no good. How do we make this work in a drum rack? Uh, the trick here, and we'll delete this sampler, is to build a slightly different version of the sampler with a few extra things in it to make it function well inside of a drum rack. So we do that with this basic shape I'm going to make here. And once you make it the first time, you can save it as a preset, and then you've always got that preset that you can just drag in, drop on the desired pad, and then uh, if you want to change it from whatever types of samples are in the preset, you can just go to your multi-sample, pick a different type of multi-sample, and just drop it right into the sampler and replace what's there. Or you can click this little folder and dig through your multi-samples that way and choose something different to drop in there. You can do it that way too. Um, so, how do we build this rack? I showed you how it worked earlier. We have a selector knob that chooses which of those samples to play. So if I come back here and I click this, and I use the selector to pick a different one, and so on. Okay, so now this is drum rack friendly. And you can actually be playing a pattern and, or tapping your keys. And just while you're hearing your full mix playing, you can just try out different samples just by scrolling through here while it's playing. Okay, so the way we set this up is pretty simple. And we'll start from scratch to do it. Um, and again... To be really, really clear, because this will get a little confusing the first time, couple times you do it. I have this one section in the document called How to Create a Drum Pad 97. Follow these steps, and it's going to walk you through everything I'm about to show you. So the basic idea is that... Um, let's get rid of this again, and let's just... We'll leave the drum rack in place. So I bring in a sampler. And I create a new multi-sample the hard way, or I've already created a multi-sample, and I can simply drag an existing multi-sample in. And we don't really need this multi-sampler editor anymore. Everything else we're going to do is going to be just down in the context of building a rack. So the first thing we have to do is, you know, this F1 note by default is just going to play exactly F1 on the keyboard here. Uh, Hello. Why am I getting no F1? I'm doing something obvious. 
something obvious. Let's try this just for grins. I'm going to turn off. Oh, you know, it might have been my headphones turned off. And again, before I do that. Nope. Okay, we're going to disable the audio engine for a second and reactivate it. See if that kicks the Coke machine and makes a Coke can fall out. Uh, one more time. Oh, for fuck's sake, what's going on here? Oh, it's not inside the drum rack. That's what's wrong. See how it's sitting out here on the other side of this white plus sign? I dragged it into the wrong place. I, sh I should have dragged it right onto the pad, which would put it inside the chain for the drum rack. So now it'll play. My bad. Uh, where are you? Where's my sound? Playing with my headphones again. There we go, there's the sound. Okay, so we don't want the F1 to play because that's boring. So the first thing we have to do is say, we have to translate this incoming F1 note from the drum kit. And let's make this a little simpler conceptually. I'm gonna move this down to C1. So it's gonna play a different sample. Now it's gonna play this C1 sample in the thing. And where's my C1 sample? I had something soloed earlier when I was doing all this. Let me clear all the solos. Gonna work now? Oh, come on. <sighs> Technical difficulties. Let's try, did I have the right thing selected? Turn off the audio engine again. Kick the Coke can. Sometimes when you uh, move things around, the audio engine loses track. Nope, what am I doing wrong? Mm, 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 mm. Maybe there's no sample on C1. Let's see. Yeah, it was just some sample that's bad from the set that I, I dragged in here originally, or it's very quiet. Yeah, you can see the little um, indicator here shows that it's a very quiet, quiet sound. So either way, you can see that it's just pulling in whichever note I do. I'm going to stick with C1 just because it's easier for the purposes of this uh, demonstration. So we need to make the incoming C1 note translate to... The first step is to make it translate into the middle of this range. Now the reason 97 is the magic number is because... Huh, well, it's because of a device that Bitwig calls its note pitch shifter which is right here, N, N, N. Show me all the device types, thank you. Uh, there's no pitch shifter. So this device is similar to Ableton's pitch device, but it works a little different. And the main way that it works different is that you can select these broad shift ranges, like I could take the incoming C1 note and shift it up to a C2 or a C3 or a C4. Um, but then you can also shift it by specific semitones. And the problem is it goes plus 48 semitones and minus 48 semitones, and that's the full range. So that's four octaves below, four octaves above. If you add them all together to the root note right in the middle at zero, that's 48 plus 48 is 96. And then one more note for the, the tone in the middle, the root tone, that's 97. So basically this selector, which is going to pick which specific note out of our kit to play, um, is going to, like in this case, it's shifting it by exactly 14 semitones, so it sounds different. Oh, come on. I probably haven't done my, oh, it's not inside the rack. <laughs> okay, let's put it in the right place. We're going to put it inside the note container here so that as the incoming note comes in, it's processed through the note chain in front of the sampler, fed through the sampler, and then comes out the other side. So now that it's in the note uh, container for the sampler, oh, let's see, let's make this a little smaller so we can see everything. That's better. So if I play this, oh, make a liar out of me. Why are you not triggering a note? You're not triggering a note at all. I probably have to build the full thing to make this work. Should be shifting it from C1. Let's see if I do. Oh, I know why, because it's 
gotta go up an octave or two before I do it. Let me double set this to zero. Let's find where the starting octave is. So it's taking C1. Let's go up one. There we go. So now it's playing C2 in the range. Oh, duh, of course, my bad. There is no sound on this. It's a very quiet sound. But if I go up exactly one semitone, it should play the next note up. Yeah, see, so now it's playing C sharp. And if I go up one more note, it's playing D1 and so on. So this is how you manipulate um, which sound to pick, but we're not done. This one alone isn't enough. We also have to uh, first do something that says, take the C1 and root it right at C4. Make C4 the home root note for every drum pad I play. So we're gonna do that by adding a second note pitch shifter right here. In fact, I'm just gonna duplicate this one. So both of these note pitch shifters are inside the same chain. I'm gonna set this one back to its default to two or zero, and this one to zero. And then the first thing we have to do is we're gonna use the first note pitch shifter to take that incoming C1 and transpose it up exactly three octaves so that when I click C1, it's really going to trigger C4, which is right in the middle of my multi-sample range. See how it was triggering C4? So that's all we're gonna do on this one for now. And then over here, if I start moving the semitone downward, like down nine semitones, it's gonna go below C4 by nine. It's gonna start working its way towards this end of the range. And if I move this one up into the positive semitones, it's gonna start working itself from C4 out in this direction to hit the other side of the range, okay? So, the next thing we want to do, uh, well, that'll work fine as long as I keep my 97 on this particular uh, pad right here. Let's go ahead and map a macro knob. I'm going to make a custom page, which is one of the nice things about Bitwig is you can have lots of different shortcut pages. And I'm going to map this knob to this semitone range in the second note pitch shifter. That's all I have to do. And so now as I move this course knob up and down, you can see it shifting the semitone value accordingly. So I can go all the way down to negative 48, which is down at this end of the range. And I can go all the way up to positive 48, which is up on this side of the range. So this is how you do your, your basic selection is these two note pitch shifters, the first one set up three octaves, and the other one, the semitone knob mapped to some sort of selector. And I could rename this as selector, right? And so now whenever I'm on this drum pad, I just go twiddle the selector like you saw me doing at the very beginning of this video. Now the problem is this. Let's pick a sound like this one. If I move this, um, this 97 in the state that it's in right now, if I move it to the next pad, I hear a different sound. And that's because it's taking each one of these notes that come in and it's shifting it upward by exactly three octaves first and then the semitone course control is then taking it from three octaves above the original and then pulling it down eight semitones from there. So that's not very friendly in a drum rack. We want to be able to take any of these sounds and assign them to any key in the drum rack and have them work exactly the same and play exactly the full range of sounds in our 97 multi-sample. So the way we do that is with a simple addition to the uh, second note pitch, I'm sorry, the first note pitch shifter. We're going to click this modulator button to open up the modulators panel. And we're going to go grab, grab a key track modulator right here. Bring it in. And so key track does exactly what it says it does. <laughs> this may be a little confusing if you're not used to key tracking, but again, I cover 
all the exact numbers I'm about to show you in step eight of this procedure. I'm gonna explain what's going on, step seven and eight. So the basic idea is we want a root value of 36 and a spread value of 16. Let's do it and then let's explain what that is. Right now, the key tracker is gonna sort of transpose incoming notes according to uh, its full spread, but we don't want that. We're gonna set the root to 36 and we're gonna set the spread to 16. Now what that's doing is it's saying the root for my key tracking behavior is going to be MIDI note number 36, which is C0. Um, basically, if you think about the full range of your keyboard, here's C negative two, that's MIDI note number one or zero or whatever. And then as you go up to C negative one, that's MIDI note number 12. Let me think about that. <laughs> well, I can't remember the exact one-to-one um, -one correspondences. I'd have to work it out in my head. But the basic idea is 36, MIDI note number 36 is C0, this, this note right here. So the first thing we're doing with the key tracker is saying, I want to start the root of my key tracking. I'm sorry, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Let me back up a little bit. We're basing that key tracking around the drum pad. So. Down here at C negative two, that's MIDI note number zero. At C negative one, that's MIDI note number 12. At C zero, that's MIDI note number 24. And then at 36, that's MIDI note number C1. And we're picking 36 and rooting it to C1 because that's the very first note in our default range of a drum machine, is this C1 pad. So we're telling the key tracker, we only want you to watch the range starting at C1 and going up 16 notes to D sharp number two. And that's what this spread of 16 says. It says, I only want you to watch the incoming MIDI notes and you're only gonna filter and change any note in the range of starting at note number 36 and going up 16 notes exactly. And you're gonna ignore every other note outside of that range, okay? So that's why we set these first two numbers. Then the next thing we're gonna do is um, we're gonna make the key track modulator automatically shift all the notes sent by the drum machine downward by exactly the same number of semitones each note above C1 is. And we do that by um, over here. This is a modulator and it's it's watching for this range of notes and it's gonna do something whenever a note falls into this range. And what we want it to do is, which one do we assign it to again? <laughs> we're gonna assign it to the first note pitch shifter of the semitones, okay, got it. So we're gonna take this arrow and click it and we're gonna assign it to this semitone value inside of the first pitch shifter. And I'm just gonna drag up a little bit I don't care, I'm just, I'm just sort of loading it up and assigning this key track modulator to this particular control. And then I'm gonna let go. Then I'm gonna stop the assignment. And then I'm gonna make sure I've selected this box, right? I, I don't wanna be somewhere else. I want this box selected so that I can see up here in the inspector the exact value that this key track range is gonna modulate my course or semitone value of this particular note pitch shifter device. And the trick here is I want it to modulate by negative 16 semitones. So I'm gonna double click this and do negative 16. And now here's what's gonna happen. When this sampler is sitting on note C1, it's not gonna do anything because it's coming in at the very first note of the range and it doesn't need to shift anything at all. It's gonna stay on zero. So if I click this, um, and let me set this now to be zero here too, so you can see how things line up. Okay, so what I expect to happen is when I click C1 on the drum machine, all that's gonna happen is the note pitch, uh, I'm sorry, the key track modulator won't change it. 
and it's gonna then feed it into the note pitch shifter, which is gonna kick it up by exactly plus three octaves. So a C1 that comes in from the drum machine should now be shifted up to a C4. So let's click this drum pad and see if that happens. And sure enough, we can see it's hitting right on the C4 value. Now, what's gonna happen is if I move my sampler to one semitone up, and I'm now sending in a C sharp one, and that's gonna hit the key track modulator, and the key track modulator is set up to say, well, it's in this range, and I'm gonna modulate it. I'm gonna modulate this value down by exactly one semitone automatically. I don't think it'll show us that, but if I play this pad, it's gonna be the same sound. And so if I put it on this pad, it's gonna automatically shift this one down by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tones. That's what the key tracker is doing. Okay, so it's gonna be the same sound again. And so now I have a way to, you know, pick different samples. Let's find one that isn't quite so annoying. And no matter where I move it on the drum pad, the key track modulation is making it work correctly and always basically map back to a C1 by the time it exits this note pitch shifter and is now starting to be affected by this note pitch shifter. So that's it in a nutshell. That's how you, that's how you make a drum, a, a rhythmic 128 friendly for use in a drum rack. And you go through these same exact shenanigans kind of sort of over in Ableton. I'm just showing you how to do it in Bitwig. It's, it's a little complex at first if you've never worked through it, but I'm trying to walk you through it and explain it so it's a lot simpler for you as you start trying to build these on your own. Now the other little nuance that I put in here about um, being able to automatically wobble the uh, starting position of each sample, that's a basic a simple thing to do, and I'm gonna do that on the sampler itself. I could hide this shortcut panel for a minute, and I'll just open up the modulator. We're gonna put a random modulator on, and I'm not gonna bother setting the exact values of the random modulator the way I had it set in my own preset. You can experiment with this on your own, like you might want it happening at a slightly faster rate than default, and so on. Uh, I'll put it about there to show you what happens. So um, I'm going to assign this modulator right here to this control called play. And what this is, is this is a um, relative start position for the sample. If I pick any one of these samples, let's blow this up. And let's, gosh, which sample? Well. I'll just show you a sample. There's this hidden little thing here that's affected by this play offset. And as I start moving this manually and setting it to a specific position, you can see it's controlling the actual uh, offset from where the actual sample start is. This is the sample start flag, and this is that little hidden offset. So you can do fun things like put an LFO on this and have it bouncing all over your sample as the sample's looping through some melodic pattern, and it'll totally change the sound and timbre of that sample. That's a fun little trick I'll show you in my next video. But uh, for the purposes of this randomization, the basic idea is I'm just gonna take this randomized modulator and click on this and drag upward a little bit just to kind of get it assigned. And then I'm gonna look in the inspector over here and I'm gonna make it a very, very small amount of change. I don't want this random dot, um, let's get this triggering in a free manner so that it's always running. Uh, okay, are you gonna run for me? Why are you not running? Something I'm, I'm missing for setting this up that will occur to me of course, 10 minutes after I stop this video. But most of the time you would be able to see uh, an actual line moving here showing you, I probably have to have my transport running. Uh, let's make sure I don't blow our ears out. Let me just mute everything. Let's do it this way. Oh, I guess I can't multi-mute. All right, we'll just do it this way. 
I just don't want to play anything at all when I when I do this. So if I start the transport running and we go back to this drum machine track, nope, you're still making a liar out of me. What's going on? It's free running. Sync. Come on. Parts. Uh, I honestly don't know why that's not running. But as you saw earlier, it was running and you could change the speed of it uh, and do other things. Oh, that's why. No, that's not why. I'm not, I'm really not certain. Why are you not running? Odd. I'm missing something simple and fundamental. <laughs> but at any rate, um, yeah, that's really wild. Why are you not running? Is it unactive? Did I accidentally deactivate it? No, it's active. Oh, per voice? No, not per voice. Because it's negative? No. Well, anyway, if this were running, the basic idea is you don't want it dragging this playhead around by a lot. You just want it moving a very, very tiny amount. So I usually set this to a value like uh, 0 0.02. Or 0 0.02. Helps if I can type correctly. And um, that would make this playhead wiggle very, very slightly. And if you were looking at a specific sample, you would see that little indicator just bouncing around a very small amount right near the beginning of the transient. And then if I wanted to um, affect how much uh, the actual randomization is happening, like from no randomization to a lot of randomization, that's what this control is. And so in my shortcut panel, I simply made a knob and assigned it to this one, and now I had the amount of randomization, and I could have said something like trans rand, which doesn't quite fit, so let's just call it random. Uh, R N D T R A N T R Ns. Okay, something, you know, whatever label is meaningful for you. And then this, if this sucker was running, which I'm not sure why it isn't. Um, this would this would create that degree of randomization. So that's the last part of what I showed you at the beginning of the video. Okay, so you've hung with me for a long time. I've, I've dived into a lot of detail and shown you a lot of tricks. There is one more thing that is probably useful to know before we call it quits on this one. A big problem with 128s, and this is true in Ableton as well, is that each one of these tracks that has several 128s on it. You know, these are samplers loaded with a bunch of different samples. See, why are you running? And the other one wasn't. I don't get it. <laughs> There's something simple I'm missing, but I don't know what. Uh, anyway, um, you do not want to collect and save all of these 128 samples for every single instance of a 128 in your project. If you, if you want to collect and save all your samples with now collect and save. Um, the last thing you want is to be bloating up your project with potentially thousands of samples from 10 different 128s that are scattered throughout your project. Now Ableton gets around this in a very nice way. Uh, almost every 128 you drag in is going to come from your user library. And like these are all various types of 128s and my naming convention that I used back in Ableton. But the point is if I try to collect and save this project, Ableton says, well, where do you want to collect and save from? It gives me this option. And the one thing you never, ever, ever want to do is collect and save files from your user library or from factory packs. Why? Well, and, and all these 128s are coming from my user library. So by making sure this says no, I'm never going to accidentally collect thousands of samples I don't need in my project folder and make that thing like a half a gigabyte or 750 megabytes or some huge ridiculous size with a bunch of samples that I never needed to collect in the first place. And I don't need to collect them because they are already in my user library. My user library is fairly stable. I reuse these 128s across lots of different pro projects so I don't mess with them too much. And so there's no point in collecting the samples, right? Ableton makes it simple by saying you can just exclude files from your user library when you're doing collect and save. Unfortunately, when you collect and save in Bitwig, 
it gives you no such option. Uh, there's two ways you can do it. If I do it from here, it's just gonna automatically do collect and save. I hardly ever like to use the menu version of collect and save. I didn't like to use it in Ableton either. I prefer to use the native uh, project manager. And so <clears throat> this is showing me all of the samples that are currently in this project. And I haven't saved this project since I started doing this demo. This little yellow dot indicates that it's an external sample. It's not in the project folder. And so as I was building out some of these 128s, I was dragging in samples group by group. And so that's why they're showing up here as individual samples that are external. They're, they're still over in my sample library, haven't been collected into the folder. And then here's all the multi samples I dragged in from my user library. So in theory, um, I'm gonna go ahead and do a file save. And these are all still external. And if I go look at my actual project folder for this demo, nope, not you. And I look in the samples folder. Well, there's a few samples that I pulled in one at a time when I was doing something. And there's also a multi-samples folder that shows the one multi-sample I had saved before starting this demo. So this is actually collected into the project. So what I'm gonna do now is do collect and save. Um, well, first I'm gonna delete all the unused files because there's a few that I had been dragging in and out just as an example, but then I deleted the sampler that I dragged them into. So it's kind of keeping track of them, but they're not really in the project. So I'm gonna first delete all of those samples. And I'll do file save one more time. And if I go back to my actual project folder and we look at the samples, they're still here, but this will go fast. Stick with me. I'm gonna close the project and reopen it. And when I do that, it kind of scans the project folder and resets things. And now, since I had deleted those unused samples, samples folder is empty. So it actually did get rid of those unused samples. And so far, the only thing that's been collected into the project is this one multi-sample uh, from when I saved this demo thing before starting the video, okay? So now watch what happens. I'm just gonna say, well, what I want to do is save uh, all of these individual samples that I had dragged in from somewhere but I don't want to collect all the multi-samples because that'll bloat my project up. Let's look at the size of this project folder. If I right click on this and say properties, you can see that the folder right now is only seven megabytes in size. Okay, I'm gonna cancel and I'm going to come over here and uh, select, I'm gonna to go to the external folder and I'm going to collect only these uh, specific samples that I had dragged in at one point for some reason. We'll just pretend these are samples that are all over my project. So if I select all those and I do collect and save, see it gives an option kind of like Ableton, but the only options are packages is what they call their factory library or factory sounds, and then anything else outside the project folder. And you can choose to exclude those, but you'll notice user library isn't one of the things you can choose to exclude. I've also put in feature requests asking for them to do the same thing as Ableton, but until then you have to be careful when you're collecting and saving. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and say, okay, go ahead and pull in those samples. So it went and found all the samples that I had selected, right? And it also brought in some of the multi samples that were here this whole time, right? And you go, crap. I selected, you know, one way or another, you'll get confused or, or you won't understand what Bitwig's gonna do. And it didn't collect this one for whatever reason, but it did collect these, okay? They're now inside the project. Um, and so if I go to my project folder and we look at the 
multi-sample folder. It's got those multi-samples in it. And hidden inside every one of these is like 128 individual samples. It's nice that it puts it in its own folder and, and just puts it under, it's like a zip file with the samples in it. And then over in the samples folder are those individual base one shots that I wanted to collect. Okay, so you may find yourself in a state where for whatever reason you tried carefully not to collect any of your multi samples, but, but Bitwig collected them for you. And you go, crap, I don't want to do that because look at the size of this project now. If I right click this folder and do properties, you can see it's 192 megabytes. And most of that are coming from these samples in my uh, various 128s from my user library. And I don't need my project to be this big. I mean, that's pretty big already and I've only got five tracks in here. So imagine what a big full 40 track or, or 80 track project would look like. You can get up to a gigabyte easily for one project folder. And the same exact problem happens in Ableton if you're not careful. So how do you clean it up? How do you fix this? Um, the easiest way to do it is, you know, my project's been saved. I don't have a star here. It's accidentally collected these things. Now, let's say I just want to get rid of the multi-samples and make, make my project folder nice and small again. It's very easy to do. You just find your project folder. You come in, find the multi-samples folder, and just delete them all, literally all of them. Bye-bye. Now, at first, nothing changes. If I come back here and I like try to bop around to different things or you know go to a different tab and come back or go back to my browser and then come back here, there's nothing quite like in um, there's nothing quite like in Ableton where you can sort of force the project manager to refresh itself. So what you have to do is close the project entirely, reopen it, and when you open it, it's going to say, hey, wait a minute, you're missing files. You probably can't see it under my logo here, but there's a little box just like in Ableton. That it's red text and it says files are missing. And there's a little button right about here that says manage files. And if I click it, it's going to bring me to my project manager, just like Ableton, and it's going to use this little red dot to show me these things are missing from the project. And if I go over here to uh, the plugins, I'm sorry, no, if I come back here and I look at the missing tab, they're all collected here. And just like Ableton, it gives you a way to go find these samples and kind of link them up to the project again. So all you have to do is pay attention to the name of the sample. These all came from my user library. They all, they're all well named. I know exactly what they are. So let's start with this first one, the gunshot sample. I click this little question, uh, this little magnifying glass. It's going to pull up a browser and you have to know where your user library lives. In my case, it lives on my C drive and I keep my Ableton user lib, my Bitwig user lib, and my machine user lib all together in one place so it's easy to find. So I'm going to drill into my user lib. I'm going to go to my multi-samples folder and hey, I can see these two things side by side. I'm looking for 97 drums, gun gunshots, underscore A. So I scroll through here and find there's gunshots Hill gates A. I select it, I do open, and now that one has been relinked to the project. And most importantly, it's got a yellow dot now which shows me it's external to the project. It's not collected inside the project folder. I'm going to do the same process for all the other ones. Um, again, this is a little tedious, but it's not too bad. Uh, I got to go find my um, user live folder again, drill into Bitwig, go to multi samples and pick hi hats open A. So that's hats open A, link that one back up, and so on. So we walk through this process and we replace all the multi samples, but when we replace them, they're no longer inside the project. They're back in this list of external samples again. And if I were to save the file now, now my project's in a good state because I, I pushed all the multi-samples out manually by just deleting them from my project folder. Then I came back in here and reopened the project and relinked them up so they're external again, but they're still working. And then when I save the project in that state, now I have a nice, clean, compact project. And if I look at the project size, sorry about this. If I look at the project size, um, Properties, 
see it's back down to about 138 megabytes. So all those, all those other one-shot samples that I did collect, they come to about this size. But I saved myself some space by getting rid of the multi-samples. Uh, so this is something you wouldn't do all the time, frequently, constantly, throughout the life cycle of a project. This is the kind of cleanup you would do at the very end when you're finished, you've burnt your final masters, and you're just trying to archive this whole project folder off. And you don't want the project folder to be huge. So you would do this little delete and reconnect externally and then save it one more time as kind of a last step while you're archiving your project. Or you might use this if you were in the habit of sharing, collaborating with another producer and for some reason you both use Bitwig and you have exactly the same plugins and you have exactly the same multi-samples that you share. And so you don't necessarily want to be um, zipping up a huge 750 gigabyte project and dropping it into Dropbox and making the other person download a huge 750 gigabit project. Why? Why ship these multi-samples back and forth? So you might, if you collaborate, you might choose to do this kind of cleanup before you share your project file with another producer. Assuming you even work that way in the first place. A lot of us just prefer to ship stems back and forth because that's much simpler. Okay, so you've sat through everything I can think of to show you. Um, I think this part's really useful and it's the kind of thing I banged my head on for a while. Like, okay, it won't let me do it the way Ableton does it. What's the easiest, simplest way I can make sure there aren't 128 saved in my project? Or how can I easily recover if I did accidentally save some 128s? I will tell you this, in Ableton, if you screw up and save 128s into your project in Ableton, it is a freaking nightmare to clean up that project folder and get those get those 128s out. I'm not even going to begin to describe how awful it is. If you've run into it yourself, you'll know. At least Bitwig makes it a hell of a lot easier to just cleanly and quickly get rid of 128s you accidentally collected. And that's another thing I love about Bitwig, like many things. So I hope this has been helpful. If you stuck with me for this long, thank you very much. <laughs> and as always, uh, I put a lot of time and effort into thinking about these videos and teaching you about Bitwig. Uh, I put a lot of time into this document. So if you appreciate the work I've done, do me a solid. Don't just like and subscribe this video on YouTube. Please also go to this handbook, follow the links to my SoundCloud or Spotify page and give me a follow there too. I'm kind of at a point in my career where that would be helpful. My follower count is still pretty low. I'm, I'm the snowball that's barely starting to roll downhill. So every little bit helps. And if you would just spend 30 seconds doing this for me, I would appreciate it a whole lot. Thank you very much. And I'll see you next time for the next video. Bye-bye.